to verses 20, we see Christ and his relationship to the law. Remember that? And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says, oh yeah, by the way, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you ain't going to make heaven. So then Jesus gives six practical illustrations of how we can possess an inner righteousness, unlike the scribes and Pharisees. And the, remember the first one was on murder and in regards to hatred and murder. Remember that? And then we've been camping out for three weeks on this adultery thing. And two weeks ago from today, we discussed the essence of adultery. And we talked about the, the deed, which was adultery. We talked about the desire that started in the heart, remember? And then we talked about the need for deliverance because Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, what? Pluck it, Pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, what? Pluck Cut it, it off. It's talking about killing sin. So, so then we talked about the remedy to a culture that's engaged in hedonism, and hedonism is a pleasure-seeking philosophy. So the only remedy to hedonism and adultery is understanding what Christian marriage is. So that's where we went last week. In Christian marriage, we talked about the fact that it's instituted by God. We talked about that it is, the two shall be one flesh. Flesh means the entirety of the person. So therefore, a Christian marriage is one that's body to body, sex, one that is soul to soul, a getting to knowing constantly, and one that is spirit to spirit. That's Christianity. So of one flesh, it's body, soul, and spirit, and we tie that into church, Christ, and the church. So it would have been easy to go on to divorce and remarriage, which is where we'll be next week, but we need to put the icing on the cake today. And what we need to discuss today is after the vows have been given in the marriage ceremony, how is the marriage to function? That's where we are today, which really brings about a lot of questions. What is, how is a marriage to function? Is it a democracy? Is it a monarchy? I mean, how is it to function? Is it a form of government? What's involved? Is it like running a business? Maybe some people view marriage as like running a business. It's just you have your money and, and she has her money and, and we just do like a business thing. That's a popular way of how it is to be viewed. What are the duties though, man, for, for the husband? What are the duties for the wife? And what are the duties for the children? That, that's what's bombarding my mind as we end this series here. What is it? What are the duties? Well, I'm here to tell you that secularism doesn't have the answer to that question. I'm here to tell you that public schools don't have the answer to that question. I'm here to tell you that most churches don't even have the answer to that question. It's true. It's really a silent topic. Just as Dwayne brought up abortion this morning, that's a silent topic in the church as well, isn't it? Church as a whole. So a lot of churches don't even have the answer on how a marriage is to function. Which is why I take the position that the greatest problem in America is not your primary political party. One of the greatest problems in America is the pulpit. Mm -hmm. It's true. Exactly. Uh, it's true. And, and that's, you know that it's true. Um, it's loaded today with political correctness and philosophical pragmatism, which says the ends justifies the means. Pragmatism says whatever works and whatever's going to draw people into the building, let's do it because that's truth. It's not truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality, and truth is linked to the objective word of God. Is the preacher straying from the series? No, I don't believe so, because in order to answer these questions, we have to go back to the fact of how a marriage is to function. And if not, then lust and adultery and divorce is knocking at the door. Rightfully so. Or the marriage could just be body to body and the marriage could just be soul to soul. But there's no spirit in spirit. And those marriages can last body to body and soul and soul. But you that, see, that's not what God intends for it to be because the Bible says the two shall become one flesh and flesh means the entire piece of pie body to body, soul to soul and spirit to spirit. <clears throat> Therefore, we turn to what I believe where the answers can be found is where the marriage and how the marriage is to function. We're going to completely move over to the book of Ephesians. This is so unlike me in the series, but 
This is what I feel called to do by the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to do. So Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to read verses 22 through 30. And then I'll read Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 30. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Verse 27 so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Now let's jump to chapter 6. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a privilege it, it truly is to be with like-minded believers, the household of God, your church, your people. Thank you, dear Lord, that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a people that can and have the privilege to declare the wonderful deeds of God, to be the salt and to be the light and to be, most importantly, fishers of men. What a privilege this is, largely neglected by all of us. And therefore, we humbly come before you, not only asking for forgiveness, but often repenting of our own repentance. We ask and pray above all, dear Lord, that our minds would be sealed from the outside world. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to focus on these truths, your truths, with fear, with reverence, and with love. All for the glory and majesty and beauty of Christ. In his sinless name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first thing that I want to point out is there's four, I believe, four pertinent truths with this text. I've preached it before, so I had to take it at a different angle. But the first thing that we need to see is we're going to see how the marriage is to function. Um, then God's going to speak to the wives. He's not going to speak to girlfriends. He's going to speak to the wives. And God has something to say to wives that's very unrealistic, that's absurd, it's unpopular, it's nonsensical ridiculousness God talk. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22, that is wives submit to your own husbands. Now you know, I have a lot to learn when it comes to preaching, I'm young in the ministry, but, but what I am learning that it, it's difficult sometimes you know, if you're really going to prepare sermons and, and work diligently on that, it can be very difficult. Especially if you're preaching twice on the Lord's Day, which is what I prefer. Especially if you're going to have the same minister for a while and if he's not going to be a one-string banjo, just preaching to the choir. So you have constantly have to be coming up with new ways to say the same things oftentimes, if that makes sense. Uh, that can be very difficult. Uh, that's why a catharsis is very helpful, and that's why it setting, sets to the left of my desk, because it comes up with the same word, but a multiple way of saying that word. I mean, you preach the Christmas sermons, okay? You can preach from the perspective of Mary. You can preach from the perspective of uh, Joseph, or the Magi, or the shepherds, but then eventually, what are you going to preach on? I mean, 
you know, maybe 15 years from now, I'll probably have to preach on the perspective of the animals around the manger. You know, what was it like for the donkey? Uh, you know, you have to come up with new ways. I'm kidding. It was supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to make you laugh. I'm not very good at that. You have to come up with fresh ways to say things without changing doctrine. Okay, relevance. Well, many of us have heard this. Wife, submit to your husband since we were little kids. Many of us have heard this. But we often go to Ephesians 5 in regards to this type of words. And the point that I want to make is it's not just an Ephesians 5 thing. Take, for example, it's found in several passages. Genesis 3.16. It's an Old Testament thing. Not, not just some New Testament thing. Genesis 3.16. He's... To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply. This is after they opened up Pandora's box on sin and turned a perfect marriage arrangement to a living nightmare. God comes back with curses because he's a God of wrath. But yet in the midst of this wrath, we see implemented divine grace. So here it is. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. That's grace. How's that grace? Here's the reason why it's grace. Because he could have said no more kids, period. I will surely multiply your pain. Grace, love, and childbearing. In pain, grace, love, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. Here you go. But he shall rule over you. It's not just some New Testament abstract truth. It's an Old Testament abstract truth. Then we can jump to the NT. Colossians 3.18. Wives submit. Greek verb meaning come up under the authority of. Wives submit. Colossians 3.18. To your husband as is fitting to the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Likewise wives be subject to your own husbands. But yet there, I believe there's a problem. Because many of us may not really understand that to its entirety. Or may be really confused by that. And why do I say that? It's because oftentimes I have heard gentlemen explain what that means to them. Not necessarily in this context here. It might be where you land. I don't know. But I've heard it before. And well, they say that this means that I am to love her. But I got the final word. What, what a cheesy definition of, of what this is to mean. What does it mean then for the wife to submit to the husband as is fitting to the Lord? Well, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that she's submitting to some type of tyranny or slavery. That's not what it means. It's not some type of willful ignorance or hyperfidaism or blind obedience. That's, that's not what it means either. And it doesn't also mean that the submission is one-sided, like oftentimes that husband will proclaim, because what he doesn't understand is what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says. Because Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says that they are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the fear of Jesus Christ, implemented with His divine holiness, is the very basis for such submission of both wife and both husband. So the subject here, be subject. Hebrew and the Greek literally means the verb tense to set under or to place. To place. It's a preposition of what I just said a minute ago, under. You're, you're coming up under. Maybe a military ranking term. Uh, hubu utso. He, Jesus exalted himself, and, or he humbled himself, excuse me, the Philippians says, and therefore God highly exalted him. So there was a humbling and then there was an exalting, but the humbling, Humarutso, is coming up under the authority of God himself, coming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, Paul says in Philippians. So therefore that's the idea of coming up under. Really, in this context here in Ephesians 5, like, it means to throw oneself, like if you were to throw something, you know, that, that's what it means, to throw oneself under the authority. Can this be backed up over the Old Testament? I believe so, because Genesis chapter 2, I believe verse 18, tells us that she was created for a helper. She was a created for a helper. So, so what does that look like then? Well, with submitting, submitting to a husband, her husband, excuse me, then that is a helper or supporting type of obedience. That's what we see. Well, 
with that being said, we see something and we learn something about the creation of man, Adam, because what we see then, if, if she was created to be a helper, what we see is the inadequacy of Adam. There was inadequacy of Adam, and, and therefore, to bring about a deficiency in man, God made the woman. But the feminist would come back and say, hold up, time out, time out. The feminist would come back and say, that that's all for the meaning of the woman. And they, they would go on to probably say that, that the woman's going to lose her dignity at this point, And the woman's going to lose her self of expression. I mean, because it's all about self-expression in this secular age we live, isn't it? No, no, it's not because, see, this has nothing to do with the insufficiency of woman. That's not what God is saying. He's not saying that woman is insufficient. He's saying that man is inadequate. And therefore, to fulfill the inadequacy of man, he brings in the deficiency of woman. Beautiful. However, the godly thinks differently about this whole paradigm. The godly agrees with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.3. Scripture spoke. Paul says that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband. And God is the head of Christ. So therefore the godly woman comes back and says, Boom! There it is. That's the good company I want to keep right there. God the Father, God the Son, the husband and the wife. The godly says, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. The godly wife says, that, that's, that's the authority that I want in my life. That's good company, she says, I want to keep. That's good company I'm not ashamed of. And she says, that's good company I want to be a part of. Amen. So we'll call that the first Corinthians 11.3 relationship. Christ, husband, wife. That's the wife that gets it. However, in church history, some have tried to say that the woman can't have any independence at all. That she can't pursue a career. That she can't pursue her own interest. Man, if that's the position you take, man, I call that a, a dull marriage. I call that a boring marriage. I call that, in fact, a stifling marriage. And I call that a legalistic marriage. Because that's not the way it's supposed to be. What, what a miserable existence for the wife that must be. On the contrary, though, the, the wife, if she's going to be all that she intends to be, for the husband, it can't also just be all about her. She must show interest in what her husband is doing. Why? Well, because it's also soul to soul. And that soul to soul relationship doesn't come natural. People look for that. That's why internet dating is so popular, because you can find somebody that's, quote, compatible to you. And, and God don't, doesn't often put together people who are always compatible. That's something you've got to work at. The old saying, don't bring, your home, don't bring your work home with you. I don't know how many times I've been told that. And I'm thankful. And I can speak up for Rachel. Um, we're, we don't have it all together. I'm not the marriage expert. Um, I'm just preaching the Bible. But I'm thankful to have a wife that, that says, I don't really want to know anything except for what Tony puts in the bulletin. What a relief. There's an imaginary 16 penny nail driven by my door and I try to leave negative ministry stuff at that nail before I always walk into the house. It doesn't always happen because I'm not perfect, but that's the way that it needs to be. But let's also get real. That's not the way it often is, man. And, and sometimes the wife and the, the husband, they need to talk things out about their life and what's really going on. I've heard of a marriage before in which the wife never completely shows any interest in what the man is doing. She's so preoccupied with her own stuff that she never even talks to the man about his, his work or anything like that. And the result is it, it, it's left this increasing need for the husband to have a longing companion to talk to. And it's really created this introverted existence for the wife and this awkwardness. So in that kind of context, it would be better if the husband, or the wife, excuse me, would grow in the husband's work and work this out in the relationship together. But... Um, I'm going to 
kick this thing up a notch here because I believe that we need to go there. I'm going to take this thing to the next level. <laughs> and um, if it's going to be, uh, if she's going to be a proper helpmate, then I believe also that she needs to uh, periodically look attractive for her husband. Who's going to preach that? Well, don't forget a lot of times that your husband spends most of the time if he works a nine to five or whatever the context is around people that are interested in his work. And it's possible that he's been around attractive women. And then he comes home and he's supposed to be excited about loving you like Christ loved the church. And you know, you're talking about baby food. And you're a mess. Well, let's get real. Let's not always leave it to Beaver and, you know, have the wife there. I understand that. And housewife would be very fun. And I'm not saying that he's got to come home to you wearing a prom dress, okay? But the point is, is make some room for romance. That's the point. Why does that get downplayed? I mean, man, build up some time in the wife's schedule to get interested in the, some of the things that the husband's interested in. Read some books, read some magazines, learn maybe some hobbies that your husband has. That's more important than watching TV or soap operas. And, and then you have these ministers barking like chihuahuas. Study yourself. Study, study, study. I'm going to say study your wife. Husbands, study your wives. Wives, study your husband. I get it. Study the Bible, absolutely. But studying your wife or studying your husband is just as important. And I'll make that case in just a moment using Scripture. God also speaks to husbands. And, and not boyfriends, but husbands. And He sets a higher standard. The wife is to love her husband. She's to submit to him as she loves Christ and to submit to, to Christ. But, but the husband is to love his wife. Ephesians 5.22. Check out the language. As Christ loved the church. Man, you're talking about nailing my feet to the floor. I don't know what that does for you, gentlemen. That's why I said to study her. Get involved in, in the things that she's involved in. Do you do this, Josh, with your wife? Not all the time. Not all the time. Neither do you. But if we do, I believe that we can find that the difficulty of her submitting will come a lot easier. That's what Jesus intended. I uh, came across the story this past week told by Greek historians. The wife of one of the generals of Cyrus, the ruler of Persia, was charged with treachery against the king. And after a trial, she, she was condemned to die. At first, her husband did not realize what had taken place. And when he was told about it, he burst into the throne and he threw himself before the king and he cried out, O oh Lord, King, take my life instead of hers and let me die in her place. And then Cyrus, who by all historical accounts tell us that he was a very compassionate man, a very noble man, an extremely sensitive man, he was touched by this offer. He was totally moved by this author, or offer, excuse me, and he said, quote, love like that must not be spoiled by death. Close quote. He gave the husband and the wife back to each other. He let the wife go free. And as he walked happily away, the husband said to his wife, quote, Did you notice how kindly the king looked upon us when he gave you the pardon? Listen to what the wife said. She said, I had no eyes for the king. I saw only the man who was willing to die in my place. I wasn't paying attention to the king, dear husband. I was only locking my eyes like a flint on you because you were willing to die for me. That's what Ephesians 5 is all about. That's why I said, study 
your wife. Wives, study your husband. That's the man who's willing to die for her. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. Another element, though, is the husband is, is not to criticize his wife publicly. Uh, he needs to be a buckler or a shield for his wife and um, definitely not speaking ill of her in the Lord's church. The Bible teaches then in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 through 28, that, that Christ gave himself for the church. Not that he might criticize her. No, that's not what it says. But to make her holy and, and, and to cleanse her by the washing of water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. So, so here we see the beauty not only of individual sanctification and holiness for the Christian, but holiness in regards to the context of marriage. Hearing some husbands talk, one may even doubt that that is in the entire Bible. The alternative, I believe though, I could be wrong, but I, I believe the alternative is where we can get in our marriage to where we're seeking to bless one another. Where, where we're seeking to outbless her and she's seeking to outbless wives or seeking to outbless the husbands. And then we, we brag on her. When you can get to the point where you can, we can brag, that's got to be a positive aspect. If not, 1 Peter 3, 7 gives us a divine warning, husbands, which the text is explicit, which says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So simply put, if we're not even willing to acknowledge her, treat her as just this foolish gift that God has given us, then our prayer life is not going to go to the throne of grace. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Ephesia, the ESV, I believe is spot on with the NASB. They're, they say the same thing. Husbands, live with your wives in an uh, understanding way. The, the King James says, Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. According to knowledge. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, we could all have our own subjective opinions of what that means, but we really need to go to context and original language to see. Understanding is going to involve uh, considering. Considering. Live with your wives in an understanding way. A cotoneto literally means to perceive and to grasp with the mind. That's why I said it's just as important for husbands to study your wives as wives are to study the husband because the Bible teaches that. To cotinetto literally means to pull out in front of you and to examine with your hand. And it involves thinking further past the tip of one's nose. So living together according to knowledge or an understanding way is not a subjective knowledge of what Josh thinks marriage is or what Jared thinks marriage is. No, that's subjective. We need to go to an objective view of what marriage is by looking to God's word because it's the only objective truth. So therefore, I've written down four things that we must know if we're going to live with our wives according to knowledge. Number one, we must understand the nature of marriage, which is that it was instituted by God, which we looked at last week. Number two, we don't need to view marriage like pagans. Uh, pa pagans viewed marriage as let us just eat, drink, and quote, be merry for tomorrow we die. It's just a business, or it's just about my personal happiness, or it's so I can make more money. That's not the way that it is. We must have a knowledge of leadership and what it means to be a leader. The alternative is to be very passive and to always say, yes, dear, yes, dear, you know, yes, dear. Now, that's not a leader, that's a follower. And we understand the theological foundation of marriage. Man. What would our homes be like if we implemented those types of things? Man, our homes could be transformed. 
truly good. Number three, parents and children. We've seen that in Ephesians as well. Parents and children. Um, the expositor is not Josh. The expositor are husbands. They're supposed to be. It, it, it calls for discipleship. It calls for teaching. It really goes back to, to Sammy's message in Luke 15. Viewing the lost sheep as the lost child that goes astray. Never heard about that angle. Beautiful sermon. The head expositor, man, is the, the father. So what does the Bible then say to children? Well, Exodus 20, 12. Remember the fifth commandment? Honor your father and mother. But, but you know, that, that's often so shredded out of context. And when we butcher that text, because oftentimes we, we think that God is playing children's church in the middle of the Ten Commandments, man. That's not the way it is. God ain't playing children's church. God is not trying to involve kids in the tenfold moral compass of society. No. The context is he's speaking to adults. It's primarily addressed to adults in the midst of covenant. It's not just some type of therapeutic tactic that, that uh, don't stick a paper clip in an electrical socket. Obey mom and dad. That's not what this commandment is about. But oftentimes that's the way that we view it. It's a commandment of a holy God whose people are to live this way. Why? So we can reflect and display the character of God to others. Don't live like everybody else. Proverbs 6, 20 through 21 my son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake, forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them around your neck forever. Fasten them around your neck. And the issue is not that the children, a lot of times the issue is given to parents because we don't teach our children sound biblical counsel. We teach them worldly counsel like follow your heart. Really, follow your heart. Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked and sick. Who can know it? So when you tell your kid to follow their heart, you're telling them to follow a wicked heart when they hit the age of accountability. Follow your own sinful heart. I'll tell you what following my heart got me. It led me to a partying drug fool. That's where following your heart will lead you to. Now, maybe not to that extent. I hope not. <coughs> Following your heart can lead you right into spiritual sleepiness as well. So we must give sound counsel. It's not worldly or therapeutic teaching like just be a better person or, or don't cuss or don't steal the marbles. We need to tell them why not to steal the marbles because the Lord Jesus Christ commands us not to steal the marbles. Exactly. Satan's not opposed to good moral teachings. He's opposed to Jesus Christ. And you and I both know that a person can have good morals till the cows come home and still go to hell when they die. We don't need to divorce morals from Jesus Christ. That's the problem with our society. Don't steal, don't cuss, be nice. And we never tell the children why. And who said not to steal, and who said not to cuss, and who said to be nice. Children are to obey, which means discipline. Well, I'm not going to spank my kid. I'm not going to spank my kid. You're not going to tell me how to raise my kid. I can, but God can. God can. Proverbs 19.18 says, Discipline your son, for there's hope. There's hope here. Man, that's awesome. There's hope. i got a lot to learn about raising kids. But the Bible says there's hope when they're disobedient. There's hope in discipline. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Fatherly discipline, man. Gone in our society. Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he ain't going to die. Nowadays, you get CPS called on. Okay. Proverbs 22, 15. Foley is bound up in the heart of a child. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. And you don't have to teach a child to steal. The rod of discipline drives it far from him. 
Now, some are thinking, well, you don't know my kid. That's fine. Children are different. They all require different handling. But that's, you've missed the point. But that's where you're at because the point is discipline must be established and discipline must be maintained. That's what God is saying in the home. That's what God is saying. Last point, and then I'll be done. Can dead bones live? Can dead bones live? Yeah, and I understand that that's in the context of salvation. I'm changing things up a little bit. I'm talking about dead marriages. I've tried to make this very practical this morning. For some of you, you're bored to death. I can see it on the on your faces. Not every sermon is going to be a home run. But really, God's Word is always a home run. It's not about being entertaining. or always hammering people with conviction to where they walk out and feel like they're two feet tall. I guess if this, if this message saved one marriage, it would be a success. It's going to be little help, though, unless we put it into effect. Can dead bones live? Some of what I said I hope will apply here today to those who are thinking about marriage. And if that's you, praise God. We want to encourage you and not beat you down. I hope and pray that you'll hold up these standards and these elements when you do make those vows before God and enter into covenant before God. Um, in light of what you learned here this morning. So can dead bones live? I would say to young girls, um, when you're looking for a husband, um, write this in your diary or your little notebook. Um, you need to ask, can he be Jesus to me? There you go. Can he be Jesus to me? Can he be a man that I can obey? Can he be a man that I can submit to? You're not going to learn that in public schools, by the way. If not, then look elsewhere, not the internet. Pray fast. Young men, I would say, am I willing to give my life for her? Am I willing to completely die for her? And I'm, am I willing to be patient with her and to cover her faults? If not, look elsewhere, not the internet. Pray and fast. Then maybe there's some like me in early marriage years that's got a lot to learn, that really knows nothing about marriage. Um, maybe you've been married for quite a while, maybe longer than Rachel and I. And the fun's really wore off. And maybe you're raising kids who are stubborn that don't respond to the discipline like the Bible teaches. <laughs> That's the reality, isn't it? Don't give up. Pray for them. Pray for your children. And pray really that God would create a spirit within you, man, that, that are, or I should say a character, okay, that they're going to respect and honor. And stop trying to be their friend and their buddy. Be their parent. That's the problem with my dad. He tried to be some cool friend. Maybe then there's some at the point, man, to where their marriage is dead bones. Been married for 30, 40 years. It's just dead bones. Maybe you know the plan of salvation frontwards and backwards and can say it in your sleep. That's a good thing. But you see, you can know all that and, and still have a marriage that needs to be rescued. Possibly even to the point to where if it wasn't for the little community here that we live in and it wasn't for church friends or whoever, you'd probably divorce. What should you do? 
Let's just get practical this morning. What should you do in that situation? I would say yield to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow Him to rekindle a love in your marriage. That's what I would say. Because love that's dead and, and love that's cold and dead. Here's the thing about Jesus. It's real deep and theological. I'm just kidding. Jesus can make a dead marriage live. Yes. Maybe love has died entirely in the marriage and you're just going through the routine and there's no romance at all anymore. You've got a dead marriage at that point. And the good news here this morning is that Jesus can make dead things live. Maybe there's bitterness in the marriage, man. Maybe, maybe, see, we're getting real this morning. Maybe there's hate in the marriage. And when bitterness is there, man, the home is like a bomb. You can just feel it. I'd say yield to Christ and grow in Him. Grow. And then love will be rekindled. And then one will say, wow. Man, Jesus can bring life out of death. There it is. Not only that, but He can bring love out of hate. He can. He took a potty mouth and turned it into a mouth of praise. Amen. And He can take a sinner and turn him into a saint. Doesn't mean you're going to reach sinless perfection. We all know that. point is this morning, man, is, is Jesus gives standards. And we'll move on in the Sermon on the Mount next week. But I hope that, that these three week messages on marriage have been helpful as we look at a Christian marriage and as we look to the Christian marriage and home. Praise God. If you're here today and outside of Christ, then that's what you need to do if you want to be in Christ. <coughs> Discuss any of those points that you have. Many men here, probably even some women. That's a good one. Could explain this to you in a deeper way. If you have questions, please see us. Please see us. Let's be praying as we consider our marriages. And let's go to the Lord in prayer as we dismiss. What a joy that it is, Father, that you give us instruction. What a joy it is that in light of all that we claim to know, which is not very much, that this must be manifested in the home. We often talk about the Great Commission and evangelism, and rightfully so, it is the unfinished work of the church, but what about the Great Commission in our own homes? What about that? Largely neglected. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, so many of us won't be there for each other, but our wives and our husbands will be. May we contemplate this deeply. We love you, Lord, and thank you for all that you do. What a joy it is to serve you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Bless you. We're standing. We'll sing our last invitation here together.